Oh, I believe you did mention that that the dividends. Um, and I think I understand this correctly. Again, if we were going ahead, dividends wouldn't be paid for the first three years. Is that correct? Yes, uh, yeah. a business model which has quite conservative assumptions, basically the type 9 borrowing only and Auckland only borrowing 30% of its requirements means that there will be a dividend payment sometime in the first three years. If we're more successful, which is, okay. base, which is not the base case, if we're more successful and get more councils at yep. IE up to the 49 we're talking about, then that will arrive faster. Okay. Okay. Councillor Boss? And then um, maybe for, for our Chief Executive, um, you'll be investing money as well, and you say you'll be investing in high-quality <laughs> shares or high-quality investments. Um, who does that for you? And the second question I have for you, um, we have a council that's very close to us that had a rather, rather large bucket of money, and it was doing exactly the same thing, investing in high-quality uh, investments. Um, the bucket had a few holes in it, and um, it became um, it became a lot less. So, what I want to know: who is doing that risk analysis? Because at the end of the day, I suspect that the ratepayers of the city, once you build up funds, don't like seeing them go down. So, who is doing that risk analysis, and how are you doing it? So, we are. Uh LGFA is going to invest in you. 100% of our I've security... I've lost money as well, though. So Pardon me? I've lost a bit of money as well. Maybe not me, someone else. So, so the LGFA is investing in the securities issued by the local government sector. Right. So we are investing in... We're just another buyer of your securities. Think of us as, uh, instead of being A&P buying your debt, the LGFA will buy your debt. Okay. So most of our securities, most of our investments will have to be in your sector. Okay. But it'll happen to be a whole lot of councils. But above that 10% liquidity buffer, mm -hmm. which is the second last bullet point in the first line there, another 10% we're going to borrow to invest in um, effectively less than one year securities that are issued by the Reserve Bank, by Treasury, and by um, A-rated <coughs> credit, A-rated short-term securities. That's the philosophy. The execution is all with DMO. So the Crown's borrower, the New Zealand Debt Management Office, also invests on behalf of some of their departments, and they're going to do that for us. Okay. We'll set the policy, but they'll execute that. <coughs> Thank you. Leary, then Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Worship. Most of my questions have been asked. Um, this is possibly one to start. Does this um, increase the able? Are we able to transfer? all going ahead, are we able to transfer existing debt to the agency or is this just limited to new debt? It would be limited to new borrowings or rollover of existing debt. So as debt uh, rolls over, so as our, we've got $400 million of debt, as that comes up to be repaid or refinanced, we would, we would as a first course, look to, to borrow through the, the agency. So how quickly then would we reach the agency level over... I would suggest that Matthew might have a better handle bit, but I would suggest that we probably have the best part of $100 million rolling over in, in the next 12 months. So, um, And I would like to think that uh, pretty much all of that, we would be coming to the LGFA in the first course and saying to the LGFA, can we meet the vast majority of that through the LGFA? So $100 million pretty much straight away? <coughs> over the course of the 12-month period. So over the, over the next 12 months, I mean... To give you an idea, we are regularly borrowing five and ten million dollar amounts on a weekly basis, a weekly two weekly basis, depending on when they are rolling over. So we would be those, and we're currently going to the ANZ Bank or the BNZ or Westpac and saying, you know, what is the what's the offer? We would be going through to the LGFA and saying, what is the uh, what's the offer? And what about now? Um, forgive me, I can't remember what you call it, but the the, the millions, I can't remember even the amount, that you borrow um, just in case? So I think you're talking where, where we are pre-funding, so in other words... Um, so that, 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 that still occurs. This is where Council, um, in terms of our, <coughs> our own credit risk, we're borrowing more than we need and then investing that money. So that could still occur... 
and it's still a, still occur where we borrow more than we need through the LGFA, and then we turn around and, and invest that in a bank account, and so that, that that can occur, and we're doing that currently at effectively nil cost to council, because the interest we receive covers the interest on the cost of the money that we borrow, and we do that, Angela, for our credit rating because the credit rating agency wants to see that we have surety of cash on hand to meet our requirements. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the presentation and the documentation. I've just got two questions. The first is a view or your view of how you feel the market will respond to the creation of the LG FA. Uh, well, the markets, I think uh, Councillor Gower already mentioned uh, earlier what has gone on to date, which is a contraction in borrowing costs for councils from, I'm just going to average here, from 150, 150%, 1.5% over benchmarks like swaps or governments to around 90. So there's already been a contraction in anticipation of this occurring. So the market's getting increasingly confident that this vehicle's going to take off. And they've taken profits, they're getting a profit from the reduction in the borrowing margin by holding on to those securities. Our estimates from talking to uh, banks two weeks ago uh, is that we will probably be able to fund at around about 40, 50 basis points, so 0.4, 0.5% over those same benchmarks. And to meet our dividend requirements and our operational costs, which are outlined in the documents, um, and based on assumptions on how much we can get going over a one to three year time period, we estimate that we'll uh, be able to on charge about 40 to 50 basis points. So and that's without actually having the securities in place and without having the credit rating confirmed, etc. So a substantial reduction in uh, borrowing costs, which leads to savings for the sector of around 25 to 30 million dollars. As somebody who has a, a, a broad understanding of, of um, competition, um, I, I wonder your feelings if the market shows to aggressively respond to the likes of the LGFA to send a shot across your bow. Could there be a situation where we find ourselves in a marketplace committed to you or our structure that we are now happily a shareholder of and in fact the market um, has lower rates available? Yeah. Um, our strategy to compete with that, call it threat to our future, is to ensure that our securities, the LGFA securities that are issued on the other side, so we lend money to LGs and the market lends to us. So on that side of the transaction, we have to make sure that our securities are so highly desirable that banks and institutions here and overseas want them. What drives that is rather than having a $5 million security issued by a single loan authority, we have right. 250 million, 300 million, which is a source of deep liquidity. Yeah. It means that buyers and sellers can operate with a lot more freedom. And that liquidity is highly valued by institutions. The second point is that we would like the assets that we issue to be rated by the Reserve Bank on a risk weighting of zero, which means that under the global capital requirements that banks have to adhere to, we become highly desirable because they don't need to allocate capital against our securities. Right. But they do have to allocate capital against LGs mm -hmm. in their own name. So by having size and liquidity, by having that risk weighting, which we haven't got yet, and having them being able to be discounted at the Reserve Bank, I think that makes us more desirable, with the credit rating uh, difference as well. But I'm sure they'll have a go, but we just have to compete on a better basis. Because that is a risk <coughs> borne predominantly by the primary shareholders. Isn't it? Yes, yes. It is. <coughs> Although uh, you have the benefit of seeing other models overseas work successfully, so institutions overseas understand this. So we know, we know where we want to go. We have a business plan to achieve that. The Reserve Bank isn't going to give us a zero percent risk weighting until we have liquidity. Right. So it's a chicken and egg situation. We have to get the model going, get the commitment going, deliver the size of tranches in three years, five years, seven years that investors want. And then the banks will be able to go to the RBNC and say, look, this is a zero risk rate asset. 
you know, I want to be able to keep it as them. Your, wor your Worship, just, just further to Councillor Wilson, because it's a good, good, good question. There's a second element to, to, to <coughs> this, which is there's the pricing, but there's also what I call the funding risk element. At the moment, when we report to the Finance and Monitoring Committee, our, the, the, the term of our debt is shortening because we can't really borrow anything beyond five years. It's just not available in the market. The LGFA is going to give us access, and that's the intention, to debt longer than five years. And, that's, and I think that's the other element. So there's the pricing element, but there's the term element. And I think because there are two parts that Council is looking, is looking to manage its own treasury risk. One is interest rate. The second is funding risk. And the funding risk shouldn't be underestimated. So I wonder, Craig, whether you want to just quickly talk to that point. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's the point of markets close. Well, markets are difficult as they are at the moment in Europe. Uh, investors tend to go towards high quality and high liquidity sources uh, for their investments, and um, we'll have the ability to be able to match much better your long-term infrastructure funding needs uh, with institutions in the marketplace both here and overseas, and deliver that maturity profile that you probably need, and we should probably try and achieve for you. Okay. So that's a good point to make, uh, Blair. Thank you. Just one last question, if I could. <coughs> <clears throat> and it's expanding on uh, Councillor Gower's questions uh, and I think uh, Councillor Forsyth. And that is when we reach um, the promised land and this council has no debt and we decide that it's now time potentially to get rid of our shares. Um, I understand the ongoing guarantee for a period of whatever length that instrument is, five years, seven years, three years. Um, but how do we sell our shares? Are, are we, does the shareholder agreement restrict our ability to go to market? Um, <clears throat> I'm about to go outside my field, but um, yes, the shareholder agreement does provide for um, preemptive rights, so they stay, you'll be selling your shares within the pool. Right, okay. So um, assu only assuming if the remaining shareholders want to buy them. If they don't, then we can go to the... There's nothing. My question is, is there anything stopping us being able to go to the free market at a stage to start to sell our shares? The preemptive rights would be picked first. After that, I presume so, but can we check for you on that? Yeah. Your Worship, Councillor, it's a very good question, and I believe the answer is that we can't. So, but I, think it would be good I would have assumed that because of all the guarantee requirements that you have. But a very interesting discussion as well, and, and the Crown have raised it, um, and we haven't been too keen to show them the exit door easily. So, you know, there, there is a degree to which we all as shareholders need to contemplate a very serious long-term commitment because it, 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 it's kind of self-fulfilling. And, and if it's, if it's you know, easy for the Crown to sell out or a particular council, it does, you know, it, it, as much as it may be advantageous to the individual council, it, it could cause other shareholders to start asking some questions about the bonds and viability. So it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22, as there is in the structure. But I, if the Act, you know, we would be happy to... Just confirm that. I know it's contemplated in the document. Um, so local government designed their own vehicles, so I, I think no, but maybe you can confirm that. Mm. Councillor Gallagher? Yeah, I mean, obviously noted the cross party support for the legislation, noting the 20% shareholding by the Crown signed off by the Cabinet. I'm not sure if this question should be addressed to Blair or yourselves. In an absolute worst-case scenario, can you just repeat again what would be the um, rough degree of light, well, the deliability that this council would have? The, well, the, there's, there's two elements, three elements. One is the potential for our share of the uncalled capital being being called up, and of course that, that uncalled capital would apply to all shareholders, yes, yes. so the Aucklands, the Christchurches, yes, yes. the Wellingtons, etc., Tauranga's. Um, and so it's the extent to which our percent of shareholding represents of that $20 million uncalled capital. Uh, the second element would be, um, would be where there was a guarantee call. So in other words, we would have to pay a share of money back to the LGFA to fund the, the, um, 
the uh, the council who defaulted their, their share of their debt, and that, but but I, but I would also caution that in that instance, the old GFA would be going back to that particular council, activating their debenture trustee, activating their liquidation process, and the rate powers of that particular council would actually be levied for that debt. So that would be a a timing situation whereby if they came to us under the guarantee, my expectation would be that that, that 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 guarantee call would be reimbursed, repaid through the actions of the liquidator being appointed on that particular council. But there would obviously, again, but there is still a liability. There is a, yes, there is a contingent liability and we, we've been very transparent about that. And, and roughly what kind of figure would you put on that? <laughs> the, it's, it depends on the, the borrower and the there. particular, and I think if, if it was a if it was a, a an Auckland council that was defaulting, it would be a bigger amount. If it was a smaller council, it could be a smaller amount. But I think that there are, as, as the chairman has said, there are many steps that would, would be in place to, to alert that. But absolutely, there is a potential risk that there's a dollar amount under the uncalled capital, uh, which could be $1 to $1.5 million, depending on our percentage shareholding. And secondly, there could be a timing guarantee call which would be soon followed up by the retrospective action against that particular council and recovery mechanisms to recover that money from that council's ratepayers. That's a, a, a worst-case scenario with a bit of how long is a piece of string. Well, and I think I think it's worth noting that we've had, you know, the worst-case scenario we've seen today is Christchurch. The Christchurch earthquake would be seen as a fairly significant right. example of risk. And, um, you know, the, their, their ability to service their debt whilst it's been devastating for that city hasn't changed, and it has had an impact on their rate payers, it has an impact on their rating revenue, but the, 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 um, the security, their credit rating, the ability for them to participate in the LGFA, and the risk on the other shareholders hasn't changed for that, that event, and that's a fairly significant event. So I'm happy if Craig or Jonathan wishes to comment further to that point. I, I would agree, agree with uh, Blair, and I share your uh, discomfort at what that number might be, Mm. But you should be assured that the primary mechanism, is, as, as investors do with your own debt, the first recourse is to go back to the Heron Council and recover those rates. It's a timing issue. And those liquidity pieces on the board up there enable us to get through that timing piece. It may not need to come to guarantee at all because we have sufficient cash available for us to be able to meet um, the obligations that are missed by that council. Yeah. And I think councillors, if we just quickly go back to Christchurch, and I know um, the, there's been a lot of legislation, a lot of legislation passed around enabling the council to continue to collect its rates to, to work through all the various rating issues, which has given added security to that council's revenue streams to meet its commitments. So I think that we've seen, in our worst case scenario, the mechanisms work through appropriately to, to continue to give their investors confidence that that council can meet its obligations. Yeah, the, other, the other second question is there are um, smaller local authorities, I mean in terms of population and budget, and to be at front, I'm not in any, I have no interest whatsoever in making it easier for local authorities that may be less than viable and frankly should come to the table and start some amalgamation process, and this is stupid, in a country of 4.4 million, don't want to go on here folks, how many we have, 90, 80, so even in the, 300,000 so the people, yeah. I'm making the point yes, but what's the that, question though? What's the question? I was actually about to make it, Your Worship, okay, right. if I may finish. Please do. And it is simply this. As a councillor, I don't have too much interest in any risk exposing this council to risk to some local authorities that are a lot less viable than Christchurch. And they're less viable than Christchurch because they are smaller. They have huge uh, obligations in terms of their territorial area. Um, but and should there be some rational reapproach and round amalgamation or, or re government reorganisation, local government reorganisation, I think there'd be some candidate local authorities for reorganisation. I guess what I'm asking you is that the tightness and the thresholds of your criteria before you would actually um, engage with some of those local, any local authority in terms of the, the robustness. Can I just respond initially mm. and, and integrate you with um, and, and mainly because I know we're involved in a discussion at the moment where our own ratios are, are front of mind. Yes. So, um, we could be next and this has been a very useful discussion that we, um, we're in the process of drawing to a close currently. Um, you'll 
recur, you'll, you'll know we're currently talking of, of debt to revenue ratios yep. well in excess yep. of 200 yep. uh, percent, and, and we're contemplating how we address that yes. and, and where we move to. Mm -hmm. um, the internal policies of the LGFA, which currently um, shareholders are looking to get a strong degree of comfort that they are indeed embedded policies, such that the board's ability to work outside of, outside of those policies would require some ex exception process and some high degree of visibility and ultimately possibly sign up <coughs> by shareholders, which would be by yourself. Um, on that same ratio is set at 175%. Um, so I, I just wanted to give you that by way of comparison that is probably directly relevant to our discussions today, so it gives you a sense of that. Um, and indeed, what you're uh, reflecting has been um, strongly reflected by a, a council down the way, a large metropolitan council, signalling very um, similar concerns and, and, and looking to drive exactly the sort of disciplines that, that you're looking for reassurance. So, so in a nutshell, you're assuring us that before any local authority even comes to your table, that those criteria are extremely stringent and extremely high, and that they will be assessed on a very cold uh, financial criteria. This is not some sort of um, aid organisation for less viable local authorities. Is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary, and, and that's the scrutiny that I expect all uh, shareholders and guarantors to handle each other. So that mm. precise line of discussion mm. should be carried out by every council who is a member of this organisation. By that mechanism, you get more confident that every councils can't help you. Because the point of my question is to make sure that my ratepayers who I represented are not in any way vulnerable uh, to uh, other local authorities where there's not that prudent financial management. Well, the, 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 the possibility of that, councillor and your worship, is that we lose our credit rating and the whole yes. system fails. So we have to have that Thank you. So I've got um, Councillor Mahood and then Councillor Henebury and oh, just one question, more relating to kind of on the amalgamation for different reasons. Um, say, and it has happened, we have uh, nationwide amalgamations occurring. Um, they do from time to time, and they can be done locally. How is the LGFA going to handle that, particularly if there are some that are in? And some that are out of the situation. What are your, you know, what are your criteria, and how would that be dealt with? And look, the amalgamation in, in itself, um, in terms of how we handle um, borrowing and lending, won't uh, won't change. But uh, to the deputy chief executive's point, the ratios, the covenants that we are proposing or are being proposed to us by shareholders as gates through which all councils have to jump before they can become a borrower are increasingly being adopted by, by local authorities. So that will become the default covenant. I understand that, but it's more if it's in the other way, where you've got some who are about to default going into problems, um, and they've been told that you've got some amalgamate or is this going to happen. How do you deal with that? I don't want to know it. I no. just want to know that you have thought about it and that it is anticipated should that happen, particularly in these Sometimes, yeah. Well, I, I think, as I said, there are many eyes looking at councils, from the Auditor General to uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs um, and, and investors, and we would expect the receiver or a administrator to be appointed in the early early period, such as Environment Canterbury, where there are issues, and the Crown has an interest in seeing the council perform. So, I can see a workout occurring before the default actually happens, uh, in my view, but. We might be surprised by that. Okay. And knowing, and I don't know whether this is relevant to what you're doing, this is totally difficult, but knowing how the local government sort of tried to get itself involved in, in um, doing its own um, insurance for risk and it's all defaulted because earthquakes happen and the world turns fussy, um, has the experience that they've received from the local government initiative, of which we did not join, um, uh, going to impact or is it being considered or anticipated? what you've set up here. Um, just two answers to that question, Councillor. One is the business model that uh, 
the insurance was provided has been thought about by this group mm. and by the foundation members, and we've tried to do things differently to make sure that um, some of the reasons why that business model yeah. failed okay. right, doesn't happen here. But secondly, this is about uh, a very simple matching of borrowing and lending. It's not an insurance vehicle. So unless shareholders think differently, the board takes directions from shareholders. I think it made a lot of people nervous about, you know, is this going to be another one of those? No. Mm -hmm. and, uh, five years time. I don't think so, but I just need no. to hear that you no. have to do it. Thank, no. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Henry, did you have a final question? As I was at the beginning, so I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on the end now. Look, I'm trying to understand this. You call this a club, not a bank. Mm -hmm. And you set criteria to, to follow, and, and you know, it's probably where banks need to have 80% capital to, to lend out 100%. And I'm looking at, you know, for 25 million, an encore of 20, 45 million. Yet this vehicle's going to deal in billions of dollars. How, how are we going to overcome those ratio costs? And though we're not a bank, we're a club. We've not got government guarantees, but they're in it. Uh, so, help me explain, you know, explain to me how that's going to work. Sure, so, just to make very clear, <coughs> This is not a bank. So it doesn't fit under the registered banking legislation that preserve bank monopolies or regulates. So we're not a bank. So we don't require capital to global capital standards. What we have got is a tier of capital availability on that screen, which gives comfort to investors and credit rating agencies that, that enable us to issue debt at very favourable margins. And we simply match your needs with investors' desires. It's a matching process. So we actually don't have any... We don't go out to take balance sheet risk. It's not a bank. We're not trying to make money out of mismatches between borrowing and lending and interest rates that we borrow at, interest rates that we invest at. We're simply matching. We'll pick up and understand your borrowing needs in February with those of Cargo South and whatever, bunched up. Everyone wants to get three years. We'll tender three years, but you'll commit to that amount. We'll tender three years in the marketplace, and that interest rate will flow through, plus our costs, to your sales, which delivers the lower interest rate. Okay. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Gow. Yeah, just something I'm just not clear of as a result of some of the questions now. Uh, we've got probably nine... 15 shareholders at the moment, probably up to 48, 49 that are, may be interested, and it's to do with amalgamation. If, in fact, uh, those 49 do become shareholders, and so three or four may amalgamate together, <coughs> and there may be six or seven amalgamate together, how, and yet, how's that actually going to be dealt with as far as probably voting, as far, because there'll be, uh, this portion of people will have a lot more money tied up in this identity. But how's that actually going to be dealt with in, in practice as far as the weight of voting and you're talking about AGMs and, and things like that? And I just can't see it in the documents here. Well, the, the documents um, are drafted um, against the reality that local government reorganisation occurs. So they, it, that, that's factored into how they're drafted. That's, that's acknowledged. Um, I'm not sure that I mean, there's going to be any. Um, I can't conceive of a change that would change um, the relevant voting in any in any material way. I mean, we've already got the fact that Auckland um, represents a massive chunk of of, of debt, and, and will sure, be a massive excuse chunk. Excuse me, that actually coming in though, add that identity has been established, yeah. like, and the documents have actually taken. So you're looking at perspectives of some new entity that isn't a player, but becomes a player. That, or the amalgamation. So three votes go to one. Or four or five, whatever. Mm -hmm. Three votes go to one. Um, <coughs> I, sorry, I just don't necessarily see it as a problem. I mean, okay. voting, voting where? At, at the, um, at the at shareholder well, council? Well, I'm, it's, just, shareholder it's just a general board. question if you see any problems with that, because it hasn't been... Councillor, I, I mean, actually, I, I think it would probably be fairly simple and fairly clear. So, if there were two councils previously, one of which had a 5% interest in the LGFA, the other one had zero, they amalgamated. Together, they still have a 5% interest in, in, in the local government funding agency. 
Alternatively, if two got together that both previously had 10% and, and voted that holding accordingly, well, now they would represent 20% and have a stronger voice. So I, I actually think in some respects the CCO shareholding structure, and as Jonathan has said, it has actually been contemplated by Russell McLean and Simpson Rees in the drafting as well, it lends itself quite tidily um, to an amalgamation situation. And I, I would also add that in an amalgamation situation, um, uh, LGFA, I think, would be rather pleased. So the, the, the strength of the sector and, and the security and, and the breadth through which the guarantee is spread is, uh, is tighter. I think the issue probably was the, was the previous issue, uh, which I see is, um, is warranting some um, thought, has probably been acknowledged, is that if, if, a, if a weak local authority and a strong local authority um, uh, amalgamate, um, that will change the profile of, of the new entity that is created, that may be relevant to the LGFA in terms of how that entity meets its policy requirements, uh, but that will have to be something to work through. Because, um, and just, right. just for you, if there is an amalgamation, that would be the scenario, likely scenario, and probably, as I understand, encouraged by government, whether you, you term weaker, but the smaller TLAs will get amalgamated with a, a larger or stronger TLA. And, and that's so that's what we cover. That's that's great. Your Worship, there was just mm -hmm. one point I just want to elaborate on Councillor Henneby's question because I think it was Councillor Henneby. You were just wondering how does the LGFA, as it lends more and more and more and more, how does its balance sheet get stronger? I think that was your question. Yeah, top and bottom. I don't think Craig, the councillors might not understand the borrower notes concept. Right. I think right. just plain English that, please. Yeah, sure. So fourth bullet point there: borrower notes. Um, when you want to borrow $100 million for LGFA, you'll actually borrow $101.6 million. That 1.6% sits there, we pay interest on that payable at the end, but that sits there in case you don't, uh, we don't get that repaid, we can call on those borrower notes. Mm -hmm. That's another source of net cash. So that isn't the on call capital of $20 million, No, it? no, it's, <laughs> it's, every borrower has to uh, assent to that. So we effectively, as we expand one side, we have an increasing pool of cash available. So everybody's borrowing more than they want, but that more than they want is held as a reserve. Correct. And it gets repaid when... Um, and that money's invested, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, so are there any questions from councillors? No. So um, I'm just mindful it's lunchtime, so can we dispose of this before lunch? I mean, we do have another commitment at 1.30, that's all. I mean, we have finished, we have finished with um, the presenters, so we can come back to this, but I'm happy to deal with it before lunch. What do you, you want to do? Your Worship, I'm happy to move it. I have mm. just one question in the recommendation. Right, I have some changes to it too. So what, what was your uh, question? I, I just want a clarification. Mm -hmm. I may be misreading it. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't be the first time. Um, <coughs> referring to page 24, obviously point 17. Am I correct in assuming the, the comment that says um, uh, this includes subsequent amendments of Council's policy on the appointment and remuneration of directors of the Council organisation to recognise Council's ownership interest in the LGFA? That's not an ongoing authorisation for the CEO and the elected member to deal with all issues relating to remuneration and director appointments, is it? It's just simply in the context of, of this particular um, uh, vehicle making any policy changes to reflect this decision. Have I... That is correct, and I, it would be my interpretation, councillors, that we would actually bring that policy back to you along with a suite of other um, LTP policies. In which case, we wish to, I'm happy to move the motion, and we'll speak um, to it if I have a second. Right, can I just oh, suggest, sorry. Um, Councillor Wilson, are you happy um, to include an 18 that we endorse that subject to the process of how that shareholders' council will report back to this council um, being approved by us? because there's nothing in this paperwork that tells me what that process is going to be, and, and I, I want a level of comfort around that. I'd be happy the with process that. of reporting back. Yes, yeah, yes, okay. because um, so that's, be clear, that's our, our line of accountability. To be clear, your, your intention there is that Matthew's appointment is subject to you understanding that, mm. or are you saying you're happy with the appointment but you wish to have the process brought back? I'm happy with the appointment, but I want to know what the process so, is. So instead of subject, of yes. can I suggest... The one and a two. 
Yes, and just 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 uh, before other interruptions, the um, the sort of parameters that are, are reasonably wide, um, and I, I just want to understand how that's, that's actually going to work. And a lot of it is about recommendations to the council as a whole, um, but some things have already happened without us knowing. Now, like remuneration, etc. This is the first time we've sort of heard about this, so that, that's my point. So perhaps some wording that covers that. So it's disappointment. I'm fine about that. But mm -hmm. I do want to know well, that process. I think it just will be noting that the process of, mm -hmm. of the, how the Shiela Council will report yeah. to the Finance Monitoring Committee be, be um, reported back to Council. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with I'm, that? I'm happy with that, Your mm Worship. -hmm. Can I just have mm -hmm. a clarification um, in conjunction with an elected member? Who, who is this elected member? What's their role? Uh, this is just yes, execution of deeds um, uh, mm -hmm. allow, requires Council myself Gowan and one way. other Council. Mm -hmm. Standard uh, procedure. Yeah. Councillor Gowan normally does it. You're referring to Councillor Stamper. Stamping yeah. it and so, signing, yes. In which case I'm more than happy. <laughs> yes, and Councillor Gowan normally does do that. Just yes. one, oh, one week query. Yes, is that, just quiet, Councillor. We, we've got a, a, the draft in front of us at the moment. Uh, should that be subject to actually what we've seen in the draft here? Because as I understand, mm. that draft could be altered and we've actually mm. signed, a, signed on the dotted line. I mean, Councillor Wilson, it's your motion. I'm, I'm happy with the way it is, but, you know... Mm. Your motion. I think the only draft you're referring to, Councillor, is the statement of intent. Is that? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. That will come back to Council. Will it? You wish I'm comfortable with the recommendation. Mm -hmm. It gives mm -hmm. some flexibility to the CEO, CEO in a mm -hmm. pragmatic way. Agreed. He's heard the debate. He's a competent executive. He'll work, he'll work his way through the process. Okay. I'll second it. Yes, good. And with those extra bits on the bottom. Yep. Right. So, Councillors are clear on what the motion actually yep. is now. Some additions on 18. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay, does anyone want to speak no. for or against it? No. no? Councillor Henry, do you want to speak? Because right. I'm still uncomfortable. Right. Um, <coughs> I'm uncomfortable because of some comments Councillor Boss made which ring home to me, and, and that is we're only as good as our investors and well market to make a big difference. I'm uncomfortable because it's three years before there's any payback down here, and at the end of three years, I don't know what will be happening. I understand the risk and that's why I'm speaking out. I understand that the rubber stamping of past finance and audit committees have come in for some flack when in actual fact the finance and audit committee actually only actually approved what council has already approved. So this finance and audit committee has never had any teeth. Never had any teeth. And it's just been a rubber stamp in the past and it doesn't give me any comfort that you say we're going to report back to the finance and audit committee because it almost feels like that's a hurdle that we have to do and once it's gone over that hurdle everything's honky dory and you know in the past 10 years or last six years that hasn't worked so i'm uncomfortable and i've been voting that way on this process i don't feel the right pairs of hamilton realize the risk we're taking now you're saying well under normal berkham uh, finances we actually every rate payer is responsible for the debt and i think they understand that now, finally. But what now actually saying is we're responsible for somebody else's city's debt as well, possibly. And that's my own comfort, so I'll be voting accordingly. Okay, now, Councillor Wilson, you, you want to... You I'll just briefly speak to it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, look, I am incredibly risk-adverse. Uh, and when this issue was first raised by Matthew, uh, I took a stance similar to Councillor Hennebury, particularly keeping in note our current financial position uh, and uh, the concerns that Roger has raised. But over time, in reading the documentation, I have um, found a lot of comfort with the steps that have been taken to mitigate uh, those concerns. I often wondered, going back to Environment Waikato, when they had that incredible endorsement portfolio, um, 300 million, I, I think, at the top of my head. And they chose to invest that offshore. And over time, it whittled down to very little. And I thought at the time, gosh, wouldn't it be great if local government New Zealand, as an organisation, could get together and think collectively about creating a vehicle where we could access global markets at an advantageous rate and derive those benefits back to the very ratepayers we represent. And here it is. 
It's not perfect, but I think this is a very competent and capable vehicle, and I think we've got some very people drive, very competent and capable people driving it. I think this is, in fact, moved from being um, something we could look at carefully to a no-brainer. This will enable us to reduce our cost of doing business in the form of borrowing, but hey, it could also pay us a relatively good dividend in time. And I accept there will be a period of three years where the Cornerstone shareholders have advanced money, and in our particular case, we've had to borrow it, and generally that's not a good idea. But I think in this particular set of events, it is a good idea, because, well, when we are well gone, I have a feeling that our councillors who will follow will say, gosh, this investment vehicle is a good idea. It keeps paying these wonderful dividends. It's underpinned local government's ability to borrow at a good rate and invest back into the city. Who were those people who said this was worth taking that risk? We want to be, and if it is, I'm happy to stand up and say it was, uh, and that I was part of that council, because when it comes to risks... This is a low one, and this is the one that we have to, I think, take. So I hope the balance of my colleagues will support that. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Gower? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm quite nervous about this. <laughs> and I used the words before, once we sign on the line, we're captured. Uh, probably the wrong words, as I, as I said before. But certainly we're locked in to a whole series of things, a lot of which is beyond our control. So I'm very, very nervous and very, very cautious. I will probably end up voting for the motion because probably one thing on the horizon is is that the markets bigger than us have actually recognised that this is probably a good thing and probably presents a threat to themselves by reducing, as I understand from some of the evidence, some of the markets already. So that gives me the balance of comfort that I probably need to actually vote for this. If it, that didn't happen. I would probably vote against it. Uh, Councillor Gallagher? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, two key things. Uh, local government borrowing bill has been passed with cross-party support. The Cabinet, i.e. the Minister of Finance, has approved the Crown making a $5 million investment in LGFA, which will equate to approximately 20% of the voting uh, shares. This is but, in my view, another example of part of the restructure of our economy, which we are seeing uh, in the health sector and in other sectors, but inevitably must involve uh, local government. And rather than, I'm not sure how many local, what have we got, 80 or 90 local authorities in a country of 4.4 million people acting alone and in an isolated fashion, uh, this is where local government, as is happening in the health sector through the DHB cooperations, as is happening obviously in central government, uh, comes and uses its uh, collective clout in partnership uh, with central government. And a degree of comfort I have is that the cabinet of this country and the Minister of Finance have done a whole lot of due diligence as to this proposal. And uh, to assure Councillor Hanabry, uh, this uh, legislation and the mechanism to establish this organisation has attracted uh, cross-party support um, in the Parliament. Uh, I think there's evidence, unlike perhaps a report we may be receive, we'll be receiving after lunchtime, uh, I strongly suspect a greater de degree of due diligence has been done on this particular proposal uh, than was the case in terms of a matter we'll be discussing at about 1.30. Uh, I would also hasten to add that the Finance and Monitoring C Committee is not just uh, licking of rubber stamps or, or, or sort of putting stamps on an envelope. The Finance and Monitoring Committee is a committee of the whole. It is a committee of this entire council. I also would have to say to Councillor Hennebury, I believe that you did your own chairmanship of the Finance and Audit Committee. And I agree. Councillor Gallagher, you're Councilor speaking Box. to the motion. Uh, Speak to it. Speak to it, because it was going very well. Uh, for a matter of debate, mm -hmm. someone was allowed to make a contribution, Your Worship, that the Finance and Audit Committee was a, a committee of little consequence. Mm -hmm. 
I would rebut that and say that I believe that the Finance and Audit Committee, in respect to your chairmanship, Councillor Hennebury, your chairmanship, Councillor Westphal, was a committee of significant role in this council, and that is the case of the Finance and Monitoring Committee. What I'm actually saying is we have the mechanisms in this council through the Finance and Monitoring Committee to absolutely monitor the progress of this particular instrument uh, with the advice uh, of our Chief Executive and his staff. Any other councillors for and against? All right, councillors, we'll go to the board. We know what the recommendation or the motion is. Carried 12 1 who worship. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you um, very much for your presentation and for coming today. Um, very good. So we're now adjourned for lunch and we'll be returning at 1.30. I'm sorry, I should be late to worship, but I've got to have an hour for something I was anticipating.